ladies and gentlemen, Ido Cal. Hello, everybody. I would like to start my talk with an, uh, a quick quote of uh, Nikola Tesla. He says, today's scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments, and they wander off through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. So I think this is still true today. So we need to go back to a scientific model based on observations or realism instead of basing reality on a theoretical model. The SAM project is trying to do just that. Create a scientific model based on observations first that describes how the nucleus and the atom are organized. Last year, as a team, we t attended the ICCF 21 conference and we learned a lot about the so-called cold fusion field. We learned that there is no real theory or a model that explains the observations made in experiments and this is one of the priorities of this field to figure that out. Uh, one of the things that a successful model should be able to do, which we learned over there, is to be able to predict results in experiments, or nuclear reactions, for example. So we set out to take a good look at the binding energy in the structure data model and, and other things like a mass defect. If this structure for the nucleus is indeed correct, as we propose, and which seems to be the case based on the five pillars that James talked about today, then that would mean that in some way that must be shown with for the binding energy as well. So we had a big challenge there and we were very eager to see the results. When we finally were able to recreate the whole periodic table just a few months ago, we started the calculations and the comparison with the known data. The results from these uh, were some graphs were created. They're very interesting to say the least. And I'm going to come back later to that later in the presentation. The topic of transmutation of elements, we heard it a lot, has been ignored by the physics community, even though they have been well known since the late 19th century. In current astrophysics, it is assumed that most of the ele elements in the periodic table have been created in the Big Bang, supernova, exploding stars, all talked about by James. And so we're still working with the model that elements are eternal and unchanging. The EU theory, however, states that the universe is dictated by electric forces rather than gravity. And since gravity is the key principle that underlies the whole topic of the hot fusion in the stars and the creation of the elements, we need to answer this. So let's see if we can find clues, observations, patterns that would allow us uh, uh, how that might be in an electric universe. So let's start with that. But first, we'll start with just a little bit background. Oh, excuse me, the table of contents for the presentation. We're going to start with a quick glance at the current geological model. Earth's electric system is up. Creation of elements in the Big Bang versus the EU geology. Transmutations in geology is an important part. Transmutations in low energy nuclear reactions in the fusion field, important part. And then I'm going to try to bind the whole thing together. The current uh, geology paradigm is basically made up uh, by Mr. Hutton, uh, uh, one and a half century or two centuries ago, who was absolutely a pioneer and, 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 and a founder of the current concept. So he figured out the layers, the stratification. Nice picture over there from the EU tour in 2016. And these are the things that they talk about, what's going on from uh, the erosion to the volcanism, sedimentation, lots of time. Water is always the, the, uh, the mechanism for all kinds of replacement of elements, etc. Uh, there are some problems with the current models. Uh, the tectonic uh, plate uh, is, for example, a um, very disputed thing. We can hardly find subduction zones. The molten core is a problem. If we melt iron, we cannot have a magnetic field, yet we subscribe our Earth's magnetic field to a molten iron core. The distribution of the elements, so heavy elements abundance at the surface of the Earth, which is kind of counter logic. Concentration of metals in all kinds of vein structures, shields, dikes, brachial pipes, black smokers, etc. And then there's this lovely topic of some dating issues, uh, dating the rocks, uh, how old they are. Um, here you see some, um, here you see basically, so the layers that are pointed out, going from all the way back when the Earth formed allegedly 4.6 billion years ago, and we go all the way up until the current day where we have the nice cars, and every yeah, era has somehow, not really understood, very different circumstances and what created all these eras. So I think the EU, is safe to say, talks about this and says, well, we had some cataclysmic events that, you know, caused this uh, to happen. Going further, so there is more than water and heat. What is that? Okay, the EU theory, stellar and planet transformer. This is by 
work by Bruce Leiborn, who we were hoping to be here. Uh, unfortunately, he had another conference, so he couldn't give a talk himself. We have an electrodynamic system for stellar and planetary bodies, which we're trying to point out on these pages here. I think many have seen the work of Don Scott, etc. Uh, we have that there are weather patterns lighting activity being talked about already at the conference here. Uh, we, uh, this is an interesting one, what he figured out is that when there are earthquakes happening somewhere, that about 24 hours before that, a radio wave is detected. So I would say earthquakes might be predictable after all. Then we have a very important thing that he points out, these mid-oceanic ridges over here, mid-oceanic ridges and the Indian ridge, they are electric pathways. We can see that, that's where the telluric currents flow. So that's an important finding because that's where the volcanism is, where all kinds of elements, weird elements, abundances come up. Uh, the huge amount of sulfur, for example, for the black smoke is in the ocean. Uh, there are allegedly a million volcanoes in the oceans active. So volcanoes, hot stuff, is connected to water. It's just contradicting again, but actually logic. Come back, I'll come back to that later. So magma could actually be created that way through um, um, those telluric currents. But there's a little bit more to that. So we're going to have to go here. Um, here's his website, and he has a beautiful journal with all kinds of papers talking about all the stuff that I'm showing here. So I'm going way too fast to see everything, to understand everything. Let me tell you this. The presentation will be put online on our website afterwards in a PDF form, so everybody can read it back. What he is doing here is lightning hotspots. These lightning hotspots is where there's a huge amount of activity in lightning, much more than everywhere else. And what he points out is that this, this ridge, for example, you can maybe see there's a, a one going to the right, right there. And that's the hotspot for all the lightning patterns. So when the solar system becomes more active, the energy starts flowing, and that's where they end up, and that's where suddenly you see an enormous increase in lightning activity. But that is due to this thing firing up, and it discharges over there, if you will. So there are multiple hotspots, so he connects the telluric currents directly to the weather, lightning activity, etc. Uh, you can see here how he connects it, for example, with the solar uh, cycles, how certain earthquakes happen. We speculate that these earthquakes happen because the telluric currents trigger deep underneath the Earth all kinds of mechanisms, and that would be the heating effect. So you get an increase in pressure, if you will. That would be your earthquake, volcanism, etc. Um, another one, I threw it in. It's a potential mechanism for catastrophe. So this is a, probably new for most of you. What we're seeing here is, of course, our current geological pole. And what this gentleman did, Mario Bildreps, he has a very nice white website there. You can see it all for yourself, and he shows very strong statistical evidence-based observation. Absolutely impressive. What he did is the current pole is pointed at by the megalithic ancient structures. They have an orientation to the north. But the, oh, the current structures point to the north. But there are many ancient structures that point not to the north, but a little bit lower over there. So all the structures on the western hemisphere, this is the basically the dividing, they always point to the right. And all the structures on the eastern hemisphere always point to the left. And they don't make a nice line with a nice equal, uh, all kinds of dots and uh, little stuff. No, they intersect at certain places. So this gentleman identified what he says are the, the, the ancient North Pole positions. So in his mind, the pole actually moved, a tilting of the Earth. I cannot explain it. Everybody can look it for themselves. Um, might be a mechanism for cataclysm connecting to the EU. Where do the ele elements originate from? <clears throat> so last year we had a presentation. James Sorensen did a presentation today. And the current models uh, uh, fail to explain these topics. Um, um, we, ha we have missing volcanoes. We have element distribution problems. We have shales with elevated uh, copper content. Strange isotopic values on meteorites. Uh, impact zones, the iridium is a famous one, allegedly from uh, uh, the, the asteroids hitting, nanodiamonds, dolomite, big enigma, veins, this is, which is where predominantly most of the heavy metals can be found, such as gold, silver, and many, many more. Oh, excuse me. 
that presentation, um, we also suggested that the elements are created in situ. That means we are totally going away from this uh, standard model whereby the elements are created in big bangs, exploding stars, etc. We think that the stars might actually evolve to white dwarfs and maybe to planets. It's a suggestion. We think that that is true because the chemically makeup is so um, 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 similar. I will show you that in a little bit later. Right, there we are. So the EU recognizes that stars are not gravity driven. Are planets simply cooled down, no longer active stars, or are they maybe fusing elements? Can water play a role in this, as I mentioned already before? Um, what we see here is basically the chemical composition of stars, white drawers, etc. But if we look at the Earth, those elements are also the same elements that are most abundant. So if you look at it purely chemically composition-wise, I could hardly discern a planet like Earth from a white dwarf, which is actually <laughs> similar in size. That's quite interesting there. Transmutations. Most of the elements are found in geological features, and like I said, those are where, where we find the precious metals. Uh, some black shales, uh, the shales are the layers that have been uh, metamorphed, usually by the exposure of heat, as we say, and we think in the mainstream that it is only magma, lava, etc. Of course, we have a different model. Um, strange isotopic values, abundance of uh, certain rare, earth, uh, rare elements in layers, and we continue. We even have um, 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 evidence right now for transmutations in lightning in Japan. I'll, I'll show you in detail. Here we have some vein structures, which if you look at geology, that's where we find the primordial deposits of all kinds of metals. There are chemicals there that we cannot really readily explain. Uh, water, water is always there as an, as an explanation, and of course, in the current thinking is that with lots of time we can do a replacement of elements, but we heard Andy Hall, for example, so that's a whole other ball game, no water involved, and we get uh, chemical sorting, chemical distribution, etc. Um, let's go to the next one. Shale layers, we see a nice uh, gentleman uh, putting them in, in a, in a uh, wheelbarrow. They, <laughs> they tend to have... Um, this is the Zeichstein formation, and it's, uh, I believe, in Europe, around the North Sea area. And it's a thin layer, in which it has been metamorphosized, and somehow it has very high copper content. And you cannot really explain it uh, through mineral-rich groundwater, etc. It's, it's not really logical. Unfortunately, this turned black, but I think it's still readable. This is an interest on breccia pipes. They are found many of them in the southwest of the United States. And um, the red here, this red plug, is where the uranium is found. So this is what they say is, of course, a volcano pipe with lots of fragments in it, nicely drawn there. And then somehow, some way, there in the center is the uranium, the uranium ore, I might add. And it's explained by water carrying it there, trans depositing it, and I don't think that is very logical, because if we look at these layers, this hermit shale layer, that's an iron-rich layer. And that layer is where we find the uranium ore. That can only be explained if we accept that there's a transmutation going on in situ. And this layer is the layer that can be transmutated to uranium ore. So if you can find the relationship between the two, meaning this is the source, with a lot of iron, for example, then we might be able to figure out why the uranium is created there. <coughs> um, so we have too much, we have so many examples where it, things are completely different. Um, one of the things is uh, the, the, the copper, for example, in these shale layers. I'm going to point it out here. And this just is merely a suggestion, but a copper 63, there are two stable isotopes. It could be a titanium and an oxygen, for example. And we think the oxygen is often coming from the water. The water seems to be a fuel for this stuff. Um, then we have methane bubbling of fault lines, and we have a sedimentation layer over a fault line. The methane keeps bubbling up, and we believe that that's where the gas deposits come from. Uh, lightning already mentioned, uh, I believe one or two years ago, from Japan, they were doing all kinds of uh, uh, nice detections, and the key thing here is 
that they found a signature consisting of a 2.223 mega electron volt gamma ray spectral line from neutron capture. Neutron capture, that is a nuclear reaction. It comes from lightning, meaning lightning is absolutely capable of performing transmutations, and that's exactly what we think is happening. So I consider that evidence, even though the mainstream models consider it impossible. Another fascinating one, radio halos. Um, there's a gentleman, did I put his name there? No. These radio halos are found in, in all kinds of uh, geological uh, granite uh, deposits, for example. And there are little radio halos. What happens there is in the center, there was a little aggregate of radioactive material. It starts decaying. These decay steps are totally known from uranium down to thorium, down to, and at, in the end, to lead. When it's done, decaying. Every decay step is one ring. So we see two or three rings here. And that is actually a polonium uh, decay step. So the, in the center, there was only polonium. Polonium, however, decays in like uh, uh, a few days and even a few minutes. There are two steps there. So all in all, give a few days, all the polonium is gone. How can the polonium concentrate in the center, in the rock, distributed throughout all the rock, gazillion of those things, gather there, while being so unstable, then start to decaying, creating these rings, unless you're dealing with an in-situ situation. So this is being used to explain a young earth, uh, a creational uh, earth, if you will. Um, I consider this, again, evidence for in-situ transmutation. So not a young earth, not a long evolution, but in-situ. Here you see the decay steps. Uranium creates like eight rings, so they're very distinct differently from the polonium source. So either a uranium source, you get eight rings. Polonium source, you only get a few rings. Um, in the end, we're left with lead 206. Then we're done. I've just put the pictures here. Um, we have the reaction here, so 210 polonium coming from radium, all the data is there, alpha particle release, in the end you get the 206 lead, and then you're done, it's all stable. That's what we see in the rocks. Uh, the dolomite problem has been often talked about. Uh, we don't have a real process for creating dolomite. There's no real recreation. We cannot really do it. Uh, Michael Steinbacher, uh, rest in peace, has been, I think, a pioneer for the EU geology. He's been taking photographs, making movies, and pointing out to everybody left and right why we have to look at this. And he, had, he said, well, there's a way of creating dolomite, and there's a little bit of dolomite was detected in a bladder of an animal, I believe. It was a sickly animal. But there was a little bit of dolomite there, so, and uh, the dolomite can only be created for, with boiling water and very extreme circumstances. So he had a very nice quote. Imagine dinosaurs peeing in a boiling ocean, just to explain the dolomite. I thought it was great. <laughs> really. So James already pointed it out. I, I have a little bit of a different one here. We have the oxygen-16 again, which we think is a predominant fuel for this stuff. In this case, we have a magnesium, because dolomite is a calcium, magnesium, carbonate, two times. That means one calcium with a carbonate, one magnesium with a carbonate. But we also have, for example, magnesium carbonates, purely magnesium carbonate. Actually, here in Britain, there's a lot of it. But how can you, with the use of water, take along, uh, if you only have the magnesium, take along a calcium, put the calcium there, take the magnesium out. It's quite arbitrary for a little bit of water to do that. And not only that, it does it through the entire rock homogeneously. <laughs> so that is not logical unless you start to take into account if we have uh, the magnesium carbonate, which is porous, water can go through, water carries the oxygen. Now we can get this oxygen plus the magnesium, for example, and creating a calcium. So I've shown the picture here. So is that a, a, a piece of evidence? For maybe, maybe not. I think we need to take a good look there. Um, dating issues, I already mentioned it. We see some fresh lava fields here which is always very interesting because they say the lava, the magma, creates geodes, it creates crystals, it, it creates all kinds of things. But we never see them in like fresh lava fields, ever. So that is strange. Not only that, they did, I think this is in New Zealand, 
they took some um, samples from a few years old, or maybe 10 years old, lava fields, and they did the dating. So the dating is, the dating is done under uh, 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 potassium-argon uh, 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 ratio. And they've taken these fresh lava fields, and they see here, and this is in million years, so one million year, one and a half million years, 3.5 million years, 800,000 years. And these are fresh lava fields, so the dating is not that settled at all. Then we went to the Lenner field, and we did some homework there, and we started by finding a National Defense Authorization Act for the fiscal year of 2017, so that was in, done in 2016. And they said, as the House Committee on Armed Services has asked the Secretary of Defense to provide a briefing on the military utility of the recent U.S. industrial base Lenner advancements by September 22. Lenner meaning low energy nuclear reaction, a.k.a. cold fusion. Then they say the committee directs the Secretary of Defense to uh, provide a briefing. And they actually did that. And they came to a conclusion a few years ago, Lenner does not validate substantial funding yet. It's not developed enough, it's not mature enough. Only today we have a Mizuno paper, we'll come back to that in just a little bit, and that changes the situation quite a bit. Excess heat, for example, from palladium deposited on nickel. This is, this is the, one of the predominant ways of doing this cold fusion thing. We have palladium as a source, which we see a peak over here in the dotted line. It's a dotted line because the palladium went away, and we get the other elements there, platinum, chromium, iron, copper, lead. The palladium is gone, and we have all kinds of other elements. This, this is a real thing. Successful Lenner experiments. Um, let me go there for a moment to see better. There's the tungsten here on the left, um, also mentioned in sapphire. There's platinum on the right, so the tungsten and then the platinum are successive elements. When they've done their experiment, they see right over there a nice peak, which wasn't there. So we see all kinds of measurements and experiments where this is a reality. They show the steps here in the periodic table, so a white one goes to a white one, that white one goes to that one, the cesium goes to promethium, I believe, tungsten and platinum. So they're quite big steps, and they're pointed out here again, where you can see them with the numbers of the protons, neutrons and the total. These things are seen. Successful errors, experiments, there are boatloads, this is just a collection of them. All kinds of experiments, access power is measured, longest running duration, power gains, but it wasn't very satisfying yet. Recent positive news. Um, a few weeks ago, maybe a month, uh, Mr. Mizunu came out, and we see a nice heater here, a nice, nice heater. Uh, that's for a Japanese house, it, it's, it has quite a few kilowatts, I believe, three kilowatts. They put in 300 watts, that means a COP of 10. You get 10 times more energy out than you put in. Not only that, um, he's shown that it is a reality, he's shown that it's controllable, which wasn't his case, and he's shown that it's scalable, which was a very big issue. And here's a COP of 5 to 10. This is a pre-announcement. In September there will be another ICCF conference, the 22nd one in Italy, in Assisi. Um, that's where they will be uh, giving a full uh, presentation of this, so we'll definitely be there and listening in. Headlines. This one I had to put in. Uh, here's just a little uh, timetable, if you will. So, 1471, we cannot sail west too far because everybody knows we'll fall off the earth. Uh, 1814, a locomotive faster than like 30 miles an hour, it will cut off your breath, you'll die, don't build a locomotive. Uh, planes cannot fly, they're obviously heavier than air, how are you going to do that, right? So, the thing is, if you listen to physicists in this way, you're never going to make any advancement, everything is impossible, you'll never go anywhere, we'll still be riding horses. 1998, uh, 1989, Pons and Fleischmann discovered cold fusion 30 years ago, so we're living in quite a nice moment. And, of course, the same arguments, uh, cannot be, is impossible, look at the models, we know the nuclear fusion, elements are created in hot stars, you're full of it. One remark was very uh, offensive. These were very professional, established chemists, Pons and Fleischmann. And there was one gentleman of the, of the, I can't remember where, of the main 
uh, universities, and he said, just look at them. You can see they're, they're nothing. So he was actually doing uh, ad hominem, I believe is the term, purely based on their own physical experience. And therefore, the cold fusion could not be possible. I think it's very, very, uh, well, unpolite. Um, five reasons why uh, fission is bunk. Uh, these are headlines, right? This is the headlines. The headline is never, oh, we might actually find it if we do proper work. No, the headline is, why, why do scientists dismiss the possibility? Not if it's possible, no, they dismiss it. Why is no one talking about cold fusion? The physics of cold fusion, why it's not real? It's dead, etc. Uh, first, Wikipedia sentence. Cold fusion is a hypothesized type. Well, there are boatloads of experiments which are irre irrefutable. So we need a new paradigm. I'm going to read this one. It's, this one is made by Thomas F. Darden, who gave a keynote presentation at the ICCF 21 in Fort Collins last year. He says, the leading thought groups of the day have consistently resisted new invention breakthroughs and change. Now it is our, now it is our turn to change our status quo. How, how can we learn from the other who converted their rejection into usefulness? They were able to move through stages of progression that brought the discoveries into broad acceptance. Mainstream academia, science and government stalled the first wave of cold fusion discovery. This, is, this year is the 30th anniversary of the discovery of cold fusion. We own it to the early pioneers and to our planet to responsibly finish our work and, work and move the discussion into the mainstream of the scientific academia, science and industry. How do we move forward from our isolation? Well, this is what I already mentioned. We need a theory that can direct basic, repeatable and understandable experiments. We need experiments and papers that will be replicated and accepted by mainstream physicists and the science community. One more thing about this Mr. Mizuno in Japan with his apparatus. He didn't write a paper that was difficult. He didn't try to invent a model or a theory. He instead gave an instruction how to rebuild his application. So everybody in the world can go there and try it for themselves and validate it. Uh, theory, what is it good for? Here we see Norman Cook, who recently passed away, which is a great loss. We were connecting to him. He also was working on a structured atom, uh, a little bit different. He used lattices, so we had definitely some disagreements, but we had more <laughs> common ground than disagreements. We were both very much a uh, proponent of the structure, so we started to work together. Unfortunately, he passed away, which is a great, great loss. Um, he wrote a book, Models on the Atomic Nucleus, is a very good one. He compares all the atomic models and basically points out they're all flat wrong, even though there are definitely good components, right? Here we see uh, uh, how we had this a little uh, with 20 people or so, way, which he presided in at the conference last year, where we're talking pretty much only about this new idea of the atomic uh, structure, that there's an actual structure. Um, just at the bottom, Meissner from the European Physics Society, which is mainstream, mainstream. And they are doing nuclear lattice effective field theory. Expensive word, basically, they are looking for a structure as well. Which contradicts the Copenhagen interpretation in quantum mechanics. So what we can we learn from Sam? Uh, we can learn that there is a self-organizing mechanism. The magnets uh, will do it for you, but it's all self-organizing. You don't need to intervene, it's all neat. Um, an element uh, cannot be created just by putting a random number up together. It's impossible, you cannot have it. You have to have the base for the next element, and that one will be the base for the next element. And that is always true in the structured atom model. Uh, the properties, as James already mentioned, structure of the nucleus dictates all the properties of the elements, every last one of them. This is the period table we created, um, James mentioned it, we need to look at this much more. We can some, some interesting things know where is it, our technetium, which is a natural occurring unstable element. And this is like a bottleneck here, you can see the colors change, it's pretty heavy. This is like a bottleneck, there's where collisions are, are, are starting to happen. But you need to study it to understand what I'm saying here. Same thing for the radioactive elements and there's another spot there. This one is important, I really need to finish this one. On the left we see the average binding energy per nucleon, and this is the graph that is always shown in physics. What we did is we put them in, in simply, we made uh, over there, atomic mass graph detail. So this is poor, uh, poor detail, but what we really did is, at the first we made a number of connections between the nucleons, based on the structure of SAM, 
Then we did the calculus, nothing else. That we compared with the known literature values of these binding energies of the nuclei. And we put them together. Again, this is not a nice graph because the resolution is too low. So we created this one. Here we see the accuracy, and this is very raw data, it's very fresh. We see the line coming up. We see the red dots here. That's the binding energy that's been calculated in the structured atom model. The blue dots is what the, main what, the, what the literature values are telling us. We can see that the lines are, in the first part, totally uh, correlating. Not a, there are, one goes up, the other one goes up as well. So there's a definite correlation going on there. Then we have a nice little piece over here, which is absolutely uh, linear and nice and steady and, and correlating 99.7, 99.8 uh, accuracy. Then, about from iron over there, we see the blue coming underneath. So this starts to deviate. The correlation seems to hold true, but they start to go further and further apart. We're growing apart in the, in the marriage. Um, this here is absolutely important because this is the difference in the energy that we calculated and what it actually has. And we know uranium has energy because when we fission it, we get a release of about 200 mega electron volts. That one over there, the uranium, it's actually the fourth from the last, has about 300 MeV. However, we have reaction products. Oh, excuse me, before I go to the reaction products, this is the difference between the binding energy of the first element, then the next element, there's a difference in binding energy. We plotted that one from the literature values and from the structured atom model values again. And we can see, if you take time to study it, that there's an absolute correlation. So if the SAM goes up hugely, the known value goes up hugely. You can, everybody can be the judge of themselves if it, how much this correlates or not. We believe it, there's a very strong correlation and I want to put out this is only a raw calculation. So we don't even have the finesse there implemented yet. It's very raw. Then uranium splitting. We're mimicking serum so it's much cheaper. Um, we don't need a gazillion or, what is it, a billion dollars a year or so that they're using. Uh, we can do this stuff ourselves. On the left we see uranium with six lithiums, six plus, totally works. And here we see two fission products, just two random because it's very, very uh, diverse. But these products still have uh, some binding energy, some of that difference in energy left, which I showed in the graph where they deviate. So this one has like a 40 MeV left in that deviation. This one has like 60 left in that deviation, which is together about 100 MeV. The 300 should be released, but the 100 is still stored collectively. The delta of that is the 200 MeV. So you can imagine the, the happiness and the joy when we found this to be true. That means we can calculate actually the nuclear fission energy in the elements. Where is the nuclear energy hiding? Well, that's where it's hiding. We think it's a stress factor. The, the, the branches here, which we call the branches, there's a gap, of course, in between, but there's a repelling factor, a stress factor. That is the nuclear energy that we release with fission. That is a very important finding. What we see here is why there are different, uh, there are different products. If you were to fission uranium, we should use, according to the liquid drop model, we should get just about an average uh, in between. So uranium-236 would be 115 about all the products. Why doesn't it split in half? What we instead see is that around 94 is a peak, 95, and around 137 is a peak. And in between is hardly there. And nobody can explain that unless you take the structure into account. Then it suddenly makes sense because we see there's a structural component that totally dictates everything. Um, new insights, um, beta minus decay, um, it, it equates the creation of the deuteron that James talked a lot about. So deuteron, proton, proton, electron in the center. When that is created from two neutrons, both carrying their own electron, they come together. There's only room for one electron. The second electron is booted out. That is the electron in the orbital shell. That is beta minus decay. The reverse process is also true. That is beta plus decay. That means the deuteron is destroyed again into two neutrons. So we can find all these transmutations, reactions, 
and we can put them in and we can mimic them exactly without flaw. That means we have the proton-neutron ratio, we have the total number of nucleons, we have the valence, we can even calculate the binding energy completely, and we can uh, look at the fission uh, energy. On the left we have the Big Bang. Uh, gravity is the causal factor, uh, elements are created in supernova, sorting of the elements through gravity. On the right, um, uh, uh, stars create light elements turning into planets, I believe, that keeps transmutating to elements in situ through the electric forces, which is probably where plasma is, is, is a critical thing. There's the plasma uh, uh, science is something that we really, really need to focus on, what is happening there. We can see in all these experiments not only fusion happening, we can see fission happening, and probably happening at the same time in this experiment. That is one of the reasons why it's been so difficult to zoom in on what is actually going on and understanding it. Um, already mentioned the magma here, I'll skip that. Um, alchemy, it's a very wrong term, mind you. It's much more than just transmutations, that's why we do not like it. But, um, there's a, so it was started with the German chemist Otto Hahn, and he identified barium by bombarding uranium with neutrons. Uh, science can already do the following, split the elements. Elements can fuse and disassemble in chunks. This is all mainstream stuff. Uh, neon is emitted for uranium, for example. And this is just an example because you can basically get any element from a uranium if you do that stuff. It's just a matter of the chance. All come off. Uh, you can add nuclei together, uh, which they are already doing to create the, 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 the very, very uh, man-made elements, like Moscovium-290. And you make already an, uh, a man-made element, and you add a calcium to it. So, the idea of cluster fusion and fission is nothing new, as we are proposing. Um, many more. So, the whole idea of transmutating should not be fantastic. It's what we're doing for a hundred years, in many ways, and in many situations. <coughs> so, is the Earth a giant electric element creation machine? Um, we've observed transmutation, geology, astronomy, experiments, biology, it's hardly talked about, nuclear power plants, etc. So what we believe is when we looked at the, the, the cold fusion experiments, we saw there's always a metal electrode. There's always something like water, hydrogen, or heavy hydrogen usually, the de deuterium, and there's this electricity, which the Lenner experiments use. And yet, if you ask them about the role of the electricity, they kind of glaze over and, well, yeah, we use it, but we're not really sure how, and we don't think it's very important, yet it's a critical component. So what I'm stating is, is that the Earth is pretty much a spherical uh, electrode. We have the water there abundantly, and the water is a, a tiny fraction, but enough. Deuterium, heavy water, and we have electricity in the form of the electrolytic uh, currents running through the Earth. So we speculate, or speculate, hypothesize that the telluric currents trigger transmutations deep down in the bowels of the Earth, causing the excess heat, melting the surrounding rock, creating the magma. Not only that, by doing that, you create the heavier elements, which we see when the magma comes up. Hence, they say, the, the, the core of the Earth contain, contains the heavy elements, they sank down to the bottom, etc. We believe that's in the... S just below the crust is where the magma resides, where the telluric currents run, where the water can reach, that's where the activity occurs, creation of magma, creation of all kinds of elements, that's what we're seeing. Um, it's a new cosmology, is it emerging? I call it the eternal universe, I have no real preference, mind you. Um, but as far as we can see, we cannot put a date on anything. Uh, how old is the universe? God knows. How old is the star? I don't know. But we can say that elements are constantly changing. We see them fusioning and fissioning, meaning going down in the periodic table, going up in the periodic table, totally depending on predominantly the electric slash plasma circumstances. So, is it an eternal universe? I don't know, but looks like it. At least it doesn't look like a big bang. Conclusions. Uh, geology, I believe, can help us find clues on how transmutation works. So what is the fuel and the product? Like I said, with this layer, this hermit layer, it contains a lot of heavy elements already. That's where you find the uranium. By studying that, we can find clues. We can see, okay, what elements do we have before? What elements do we have after? What fused with what or what happened there?
we're hoping to go in the future into much more exploration of this electric earth concept, looking at, and we're very much uh, trying to assist the Leonard field by providing this, this model, the theoretical explanation, and a very easy way to uh, show any kind of nuclear reaction, and that way um, we hope to assist them. We do get a new picture. Um, the geology is where the sciences come together. It's where physics comes together, chemistry comes together, even biology comes together. They're all coming together there. I believe when we study our own Earth, we can find answers to these questions from creation to creation of elements to why we have mountains, etc. Although Andy has a lot to say there. Thank you. On behalf of the team. <laughs>